Let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to come together today, Lord. Hopefully nothing will come out of my mouth today that is not a direct revelation from you. Lord, as we look forward to fellowshipping in your word today, give us direction, give us guidance, give us illumination of your word of what it all means so that we can put it down into our spirit so when we need it, we can call it up. When the Holy Spirit prompts us in the upcoming week, when we can encounter other people, let's give them the truth of the gospel and let you have a relationship with them. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, we are in the Assembly of God Statement of Fundamental Truths. And just as a recap, so if anybody remembers, how many do we have as Assembly of God people? Sixteen. And we also have core doctrines. How many of those? Four. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. And as we mentioned last week, those are salvation, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, divine healing, and second coming of Christ. And why are those core doctrines of the 16, why are those to us as a church the four most important? Foundational truths. But why do we focus on those? What is the purpose of a church? To win the loss. Coincidentally, those four core doctrines are how you do that. So obviously that's why those are core doctrines. As we mentioned before, the church obviously does meet the needs of the church members, but that's not the primary function of why we exist. We exist to reach the lost world. Once you become a member of the body of Christ, then you have the power and the gifts and everything that God will give out that you can become sufficient in this life, but it's those who are blinded to the truth that we're trying to reach in regard to it. So one of the problems that we have with churches in America today is is they have a tendency, especially as they grow larger, to turn inward and focus on what their needs are. And that's very dangerous, and that's why most large churches become lukewarm after a while. It's very unusual for large churches, even though everybody wants a large church. You really should be careful of that, because that can be very dangerous. But the vast majority, probably 98% of all churches in the world, or less than 50 members, I don't know if you know that. Mega churches, and a mega church is considered any church over 200 members, or less than half a percent of all the churches in the world. It's just a very unusual number that you have that. But a good, healthy church is typically 50 to 100. And what happens is, and we don't want to do this, but the same thing is with classes, is if Bible classes get big, then what's the ideal number? Who knows specifically? But at some point, one of the purposes of why I teach is not just to give you the knowledge that I know, but it's to teach you how to think God-like so that you can also teach other people. At some point, if I'm doing my job correctly as a teacher, I've got to raise and teach other people to be teachers so that they can go out and do the same thing because obviously 10 teachers can affect a lot more people than just one teacher. And the same thing in church bodies. When we get to some point, whatever the number that is, God knows, and if we keep in touch with him, he'll let us know. But we need to break off and start other churches with the resources and the talents, et cetera, that we have here. So it should be a dynamic process, but if we want to do that and we want to be successful, those four core doctrines of the 16 fundamental truths or how you're going to accomplish that. And just recap for the benefit of people who didn't see this last week, we mentioned thus far that the Word of God is really the way that God communicates with us to give us the truth, and that we mentioned that ideally anyone who studies should have a parallel Bible, and I would recommend that it be a King James, and whatever modern translation that you want, the most popular worldwide is the NIV, and I explained to you why that is, and over the last couple of weeks, I traced the history of the English Bible that some came out of the majority text, 22,000, some came out of the minority text, three, and that the modern versions are almost exclusively out of the minority text. The reason why it's important, it is biased in its writings because it teaches eternal security. It teaches replacement theology that the Jews have been replaced by the church and do not have a place in God's plan anymore, salvation. And lastly, it plays down the power of the Holy Spirit and the supernatural of God. And that's important to us as Pentecostals. So it's not that you can't look at the modern translations, and I always tell people it's kind of like playing golf. If you go out in the wind and you're playing golf, you can't hit it the way you normally do because the wind will blow it off the golf course if you hit it right down the middle. 
you have to play it left or right depending on how the wind's blowing and adjust for it and let the wind take it in there. If you use the modern translations okay and I get it, in fact I had, I think it was you last week that said you had a little trouble with the old English language in the King James Version and I get that. <clears throat> and the modern translations will give you a gist of it, but I demonstrated in passages such as Romans 3.25 or Ephesians 4.30 that the translation is 180 degrees as far as what the meaning of the text is, so you have to understand the bias is there. But if you don't understand the verbiage in the King James, you can go to the modern translation and look at it. But if there is a conflict, in my opinion, based on the research that I did and what I've told you, always go with the King James. James because that's going to be the correct version as far as the theology is concerned. You have to understand. And it's not unusual. I know some people are surprised. In fact, the vast majority of pastors in the country would not even know what I'm talking about in this subject. But do you think, just common sense, that Satan would let the Word of God go untampered with and unattacked through all of the eons that this world is here? If he can, he's going to do it. And because, as I explained, like in Ephesians 4.30, it's only one word that has changed, but it completely changes the meaning of the passage. The vast majority of people, because of poor education, in America now don't have the grammatical skills or the English skills to even understand what's happening there even if they see it and as I explained to you as we went through our study of Psalms 90 that most people because you have built-in pre-biases you'll look at it and not even pay attention anyway because you only look and accept what you already believe anyway and you just ignore what it says there and that's just human tendency so be careful with that second of all we need to understand that, as I explained last week, that these 16 points and four core doctrines are non-negotiable as far as the assembly of God's. This is what makes us who we are. If you don't believe these, and I don't mean this to be mean, but this may not be the church for you, because if you don't believe this, there is no way that we can come together as a church of one accord. And the only way that God will move into this church, and a couple of weeks ago when we had a nice little service in there, I explained that that what we witness there is based on the Word of God. And the only reason that we know that it was of God is because we know what the Word was. God is a God of order, but we have to be of one accord. If you want revival, if you want a movement of God, if you want a healing service, then we as a people better come together in accord to what God expects of us. Again, it took 50 days for 500 to get windled down to 120 in the upper room, and only once the 120 locked in together as a group did God finally appear in the divided tongue of fire and tongue speaking, etc. occurred there. So we have to understand that. If there is division on minor points, we can live with that. If it gets to these 16 points, and especially the four core, we got a real problem here. So again, it's not just Steve Bowman saying this. This is what we believe as a collection of churches, that these are non-negotiable. This language doesn't come from me. This comes directly off of their website. The reason why this is important and why we feel that the Bible is important, if you look on the outline, it says the Bible is our all-sufficient rule for faith and practice. It is a manual for our lives. If you want to be successful in this life, you have to read the Bible. The reason why most people stumble and fall, and of course a lot of churches and denominations will tell you that once you say the sinner's prayer, you can't stumble and fall and God will never let you out of the kingdom once you're in it. We know that that's not true. In fact, all of the Bible books in the New Testament, were they written to non-believers or believers? They were written to believers. A non-believer will never pick up the Bible and read it because he doesn't believe. So only believers were reading the letters of Paul and different people there. The warnings were to believers to be careful and finish the race and not fall away and to indulge in sin and all of those things because there is a consequence to it. So we have to understand. And I also mentioned before in our first class that there is only one way that you can grow in your faith. Only one way. What is that? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You cannot get determined and say, I'm going to be faithful. It's impossible. You can't do it. Why? Because you don't think like God does. God's ways are foolish to man. They're not the way that we would do things. I promise you, if man wrote the Bible 
it would not read anything like it does. When we tell people who are failing in their finances that the only way that you can successfully succeed financially in this world is give up 10% of what you can already afford already to get by, they look at you and their eyes just go blinking. They don't get it. How can I make it on 90% when I can't even survive on 100% because it is a godly principle? It doesn't make sense because it is a spiritual concept and you have to understand and be able to tap into the spiritual world. But the Bible also tells us about the demons and the spirits and Satan and how they work and their MOs and all of that and how we're going to get attacked and when we're going to get attacked, etc. The entire Bible is a lesson of the past history of how this stuff happened that we can draw upon and be successful. So we can't do it if we don't read it. And Barner Research talks about they do polls of Christians. And as an example, these concepts are hard. And we know that people aren't in the Bible for two reasons. Do you know how many faithful evangelical Christians and evangelical Christians are those who state that they believe in the Bible and they attend a church at least once a month? That's a faithful Christian. What percentage of evangelicals actually faithfully tie? Do you know what the percentage is? Probably 10%. 8%. And do you know what the average tithe of the typical evangelical is in America? We are the wealthiest nation on this planet. $30 a month is the average tithe of the 8%. Imagine what we accomplish as a church body. Could you imagine what we could do if people faithfully tithed, really, their 10%, their first fruits, and they did it 100% across the board? We could transform this country. Second of all, of those who do believe in the Bible, of these 16 points, they only believe two of the 16 points. As I explained to you, a lot of what we teach here as a denomination, and you've heard in this class, is a vastly minority position in the world of Christianity. That's in Christian worlds. If we're talking about the non-believing crew, we're totally out in left field. But the vast majority of people do not believe there's going to be the rapture in the church. The vast majority of people do not believe that sin will cost you your relationship with God once you say a prayer for five seconds and you go back to the way you are. People do not believe in the consequences of sin today. In fact, I have something to hand out to you next week I'll give you, and it has a comparison between the biblical Jesus and today's Jesus, and it just goes point by point as to show the difference differences between those. I saw it on Facebook and I pulled it off. So we need to understand that if we want to be successful, we have to look at the Bible. That's how we do it. And the statement of fundamental truths is simply the basis of fellowship among us that we all speak the same thing, which is what I said. If we want to become of one accord, we have to have it. And I explained to you, I think a week ago, that the reason why America is falling apart is a lot of reasons. We've turned our back on God and we've gotten away from the principles. In fact, it always killed me that the rationale of not having the Ten Commandments anymore in our schools, I don't know if you remember this, but the Supreme Court basically said, if we put them on the walls, then our children will read them and learn the principles and we can't have that. It's just amazing the rationale behind it. But second of all, it's because of language. Language is the common unifier in a nation. If you don't all speak it, you can't come together. And we no longer speak English. We now, if you go to Los Angeles as an example, I think their ballots are in 16 different languages. But we're all hyphenated Americans. We're African Americans. We're Mexican Americans, etc. The same thing happens to a little degree in the church community because people always ask me, what church do you belong to? And I always respond to them, the body of Christ, I am a Christian, but I happen to go to Assembly of God Church because it's in that order. It's not that I am I am a Pentecostal before all else. That's not the case there. But most people, you're either a Baptist, a Catholic, etc., and that's what <coughs> matters there. But again, that's the divisions. The same thing happens even in the church community, so we have to be careful of that. Our scripture to look at is 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Again, how do you do that? In our own abilities as human beings, we cannot come together. And the reason why it comes down to our basic humanity. What we got from Adam and Eve is physical depravity. 
what it means is my body is deteriorating and my physical needs overcome the power of my mind and my will and I will always in my own power succumb to it. In essence, I will always be selfish because I am so out of balance I'm trying to make my ship right so to speak. All of my energy, all of my time, all of my thoughts will be focused on that. If I do it on my own, I cannot worry about your needs because I'm too worried about my needs. Only when I have been born again, my spirit man is turned on and I have fellowship with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in my life, can I become balanced and I can strengthen my will because I know through my mind and through my reason that the consequences of disobeying God is not a good thing and that by being obedient my life will be better. I will strengthen my will to overcome my physical depravity and therefore I can focus on the rest of the world because I'm not worried about survival. I'm able to go forward with the assurance of God that my eternity is secure in the future. So therefore I can now worry about other people. So in essence that's what that scripture is saying get rid of those divisions get rid of it so we become of it but the way that you do it is through the Word of God and we study it and we trust in it that's why the first day if you remember that the message of this class that I came up with is really a statement of the entire Christian path the Bible I read it I believe it I live it it sounds like a very simple message but it has so much theology in that, that if you follow those steps, then you will be successful. And then we look to Acts 2.42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. The interesting thing about it is, and this is a difficult thing in the church today, because we have been conditioned for the last 30 to 40 years, the last two generations, that we can be like Mike, that through the power of the human mind that we can overcome things and that I have the ability to make the decision and no one is going to tell me either through authority or through knowledge that they know more than I do. I get challenged as a Bible teacher continuously. When I was on radio and television, I was part of the reason I did what I did was so that people could challenge me and I could respond them back. But people have always challenged my teachings from the very first day that I have been called to teach. In America today, there's a lot of people who don't like our current president. And I understand that. There are things that he does that I do not agree with, but that's true across the board. And he probably is the least aligned to conservatism and Christianity of any president we've had, at least in my lifetime, for sure. But to a certain degree, the office of the presidency still degrees a decorum and a bit of respect. And there is a difference between disagreeing with the man and disagreeing with the office, but we've lost that. Now, when the president goes off into the public, there'll be people screaming and shouting and cussing him and bad-mouthing him, etc. And the same thing is true. There may be a time as a teacher or a leader of the church when Pastor Eddie preaches or I teach you don't agree with me and I'm not pointing at anyone in this room, I'm just saying this generically. But the office of being a representative of God deserves respect. So therefore, if you don't agree with me, that is fine. But what I would recommend that you don't do is walk into the class and never come back because you think you know more. I'm not saying that I know everything, but I do say that I study this a whole lot. But I am willing to discuss any matter of anyone that if you disagree with me, let's look at the Word of God. Because it doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what I believe, it's what God believes and that we follow that. And over the years, I have changed my opinion. Not a whole lot, because I do try to study a lot, but I have changed my opinion on a few things. The reason why that's important, if you look at the scriptures, is they followed whose teachings? Their own? Who's? Jesus. Jesus ultimately, but the apostles who were his disciples. There has to be an order that you follow. If you're not on the board and you're not a deacon of a church, you can voice your opinion, but if you want to make a difference, next election time, become a deacon. But until then, respect the decisions of the deacons and don't be disrespectful. If you don't necessarily like the pastor, remember that he is God's chosen vessel in this church and that you have to follow him even if you don't agree. And just as a child is often the case, you may not understand 
what the pastor is saying or why he's saying it, but if he is a godly man following God's will, he has some insight that you probably don't have and sometimes you just have to accept things because of the way they are. The reason I'm saying all of this stuff is important. There is a pattern that God has created and it's important that we follow this as a church. So there has to be doctrine. The next part of that is there has to be fellowship. You cannot go in this life as a Christian all alone. It was not designed to be that way. Whether you realize it or not, the human was not created to be a solitary island out in the sea of life. We were created to fellowship. My wife, and it's always amazing me that no matter where we go, people gravitate to her personality and they like her. That's not always been the case with me. I have a tendency to polarize a little bit more than my wife does. And that's okay, that's more who I am. But even as a person, I like my private time away from other people. Some of that is because in so many areas of my life, I've been in front of people in the public and I just don't want that all the time. I want to get away from it. Again, it gets back to our selfish principle. It's not just what we want. In here, we have a lot of experience in Christianity. Out there, there's a lot of people who are novices to the faith. They need your leadership and your guidance and your teachings. It's not just what we get out of that fellowship. It's what can we give to other people in that fellowship. That's why you have to. When you take on the cloak of Christianity, you take on it and say, Lord, I will do your will and I will bring the lost. People turn to Jesus because his teachings, if you are following him, are reflected in your life and it's that that draws you're like a lightning bug if you're following the principles of Jesus Christ and you will draw people to you because Jesus was the most remarkable man ever on this earth and people gravitated to him because he was God but it was the way that he lived the things that he taught the truth anytime you encounter anything ask yourself who is going to benefit from this action or this decision is it going to be me? If it is, you're sinning compared to another person that you're dealing with in regard to it. If it's a principle, just always ask yourself. If I am taught that I don't have to worry about my salvation and because I said a prayer and I can go ahead and live my same lifestyle that I did before, who do you think benefits from that teaching? Is it me? Obviously. Is it Satan? Obviously. Is it God? No. Do you think that's a godly principle? And I don't care where you get it from. I didn't even mention what the principle was. You always ask that question. But the same thing. If I choose to not fellowship with my brother Christians, who benefits from that? If I choose to be alone, does anyone other than myself benefit from that? Well, sometimes if you're cantankerous, maybe the people don't want you around them, and that's the case. But typically speaking, the focus is never on me. That is a thought thinking like a man of this world. It is always on everyone else. A non-Christian looks inward. A Christian looks outward. So if I choose not to participate, or if you're not involved in a ministry, or some calling in the church, you're being selfish, guys, because you have something that someone else could benefit from. And by you choosing to keep it to yourself, you're not helping the body of Christ. You may not think you have any skill or talent, but you do. I don't know what it is, but you do in some way. And someone will benefit from us. No one knows what the appendix is for in our body, but we got one. So some reason it was there. We lost the use over the years, but at some reason God created an appendix in there for some reason. I guess if no other reason, it's just a little time bomb that if people are rebellious, he can flick it on and cause you to come back to them or what. I don't know whatever reason, but there's a reason in regard to it. There is not a part of the human body that's not there for a reason. There is not a person in this church who is not here but for a reason, so you have to do that. And we come together in the same mind, in the same judgment. Now, the same mind can only be if we're getting similar teachings and we believe it and we accept it, but the same judgment means what? It's how I think through the process and it's how I carry out my actions based on the information that I have. If I throw a set of facts to you, Will everyone in this room, in all likelihood, come up with the same response and do something? If I told you to put these chairs away, do you think everybody would do it exactly the same way? Why? Because we're thinking individually. 
But if we think like the mind of Christ, based on the Word of God, when it comes to spiritual principles, we all will come to the same conclusion, and we will do it the same way. Now, that doesn't mean as humans we lose our individuality, but when it comes to the doctrine of God, we have to do that, because that's how you become one of a court. We have to swallow our pride. It is not about us individually. It is about bringing the glory of Christ. One of the greatest transformations that you'll ever have in your life is the day that you finally quote unquote get it and understand I'm not here for me. It is the most liberating day. Most people when you come to Christ, you come to Christ as we've already explained I think in class one. Why? Why do you turn to Christ? Who are you turning to Christ for? Yourself. Why? Why? You're being drawn. You are being drawn, but why ultimately from an intelligent standpoint do you choose to turn to Christ? Because the Holy Spirit has convinced you that hell is real and rebellion will cause you to be eternally in hell. It is a selfish reason, friends, why you turn to Christ. I do not want to be condemned. Now, people will argue and say there's no hell. If there is no hell, then they have truly never been convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit. The second reason, which we'll get in a point when I get to our scriptures, about scripture, is disbelief of the scriptures and that's a problem also but ultimately we turn to selfish reasons when I have led people to Christ the first thing that I tell people is and most of the time what happens in a lot of churches is they will come to Christ there'll be an altar call they'll give their life to Jesus and then everybody walks away they go out the door they never talk to anybody again sometimes you see them again sometimes you don't see them again but they're mainly concerned about getting lunch that's the only thing and if you tell them anything it's where the restaurant is I always said the most dangerous spot in any church Church is between the back door and where you're at if indeed church is over because you're gonna have a stampede going out for lunch first thing that I always say to everybody is I pull them aside and I say look welcome to the body of Christ I'm so excited for you but realize that you are now more in danger than you have ever been in your entire life because up to this point you were not a threat to Satan now you are he is gonna focus all of his minions to attack you right now in a way that you have never been attacked in your life because as a non-believer you're no threat to him because you're in his camp when you become a child of God you are now a risk and a mature Christian he's not gonna be able to draw away a brand new baby Christian is so vulnerable to his raw meat and he is going to be attacked so I tell them get in church faithfully get into the Word of God Talk to someone and mentor you, etc. Because if you don't, and I look at them, odds are you're going to be lost and you're going to up in hell. And that's a very tough thing to say to someone right after they turn to Christ. But it is honest because you're vulnerable. What happens is almost more dangerous than being a non-believer because you have a little bit of knowledge. You don't understand it. You don't know how to use it. You don't really know that you're a threat to anybody, etc. And you think everything's hunky-dory. That's why when the first disappointment comes along, they often fall away, as you often see, because they thought that things were supposed to be better now. That's a danger. So again, that's where that fellowship comes into play. That's why it's important that you have people get around them and protect them. That's some of the responsibility that we have. They know about God, but they don't really know how God operates. They don't know how Satan operates. They don't understand the importance of prayer. They don't understand the importance of fellowship. They don't understand the importance of getting into Bible study and studying doctrine. They don't understand all of that because they were just selfish 30 seconds before they're still going to be selfish, and it still is all about them. That's why it's a process. It's a sanctification process. But at some point, you will actually open your eyes, and you will say, it's not about me. It never was about me. I am a created being, and for the glory of God, I wouldn't even be here. It is all about Him. I was created to bring glory to God in whatever skill and talent and way that He wants to do it. And when you realize that, man, do you move up to the next level of being a Christian. And then you'll understand, and then when you learn things like being baptized in the Holy Spirit, you'll understand and release the power. It's not just words on paper. It's not just an intellectual knowledge of God. There is real power in the name and the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ that can overcome this world. You can be an overcomer. You don't just have to exist on your own abilities. You can actually draw on the power of the entire universe that if it's in God's will, you can actually move mountains. As hard as that is, and we think of just that as a concept, we don't get it. As a man, we can't do it. 
But truly, if you believe in God and you are faithful and you have been baptized in the Spirit, you can call on the power of God to rebuke Satan the most powerful angel that there was, you can actually put him under your foot. You can do greater things than Christ did on this earth with his power. And you think about that. What's a cold? What's a sickness? What's a heart disease? What's a knee problem, etc.? When I can call on the God of the universe and I can draw upon his power, when you realize how much there is, and if you're going to be selfish, you can look at it a little selfish way. Man, if you want power, that's true power. That's agape power. That's dudama power. That is power that you want to draw upon. And you realize that. But it can only happen if you base it on doctrine and you come together in fellowship and you become one and you unify, etc. That's why this is important. And then the last part of that was breaking and bread. And we've got away from that. That's probably the one area that we don't do. And that's that we don't actually go out and fellowship probably as much as we used to. Some of that's cultural today. We just don't get together as much as we used to. Any questions up to this point? Okay. Now, this is a statement from them. This phraseology employed in the statement is not inspired nor contended for, but the truth set forth is held to be essential to a full gospel ministry. No claim is made that it covers all biblical truth, only that it covers our need as these fundamental doctrines. We do believe that these are the core doctrines, but there is not a chapter and a verse that you can go to and say, out of heaven, I give these 16 commandments with four core doctrines, and this is what you shall believe. Based on our understanding and the illumination of the Holy Spirit's teachings, we believe that this is it. And as I told you, I am an Assembly of God person because I researched it and I felt that this church, or at least this collection of churches, because we don't have a ecclesiastical structure in the church where there's a central authority and it comes down and dictates things. I believe that it is correct, but it is also our interpretations of the scriptures. That's why there is disagreement among denominations. But I promise you, if you read these and you're open to the Holy Spirit and you follow these doctrines, you will receive opposition, not only in this world, but even in the Christian community, the vast majority of Christians do not believe what is on these pages. So be aware that if you choose to be a faithful Christian, you will be attacked by not only the outside world, but even those within the church itself who are going to disagree with you. Because ultimately, if there is disagreement and discord, who benefits from that? Satan. Satan. People are always contesting things. How can you not realize what's happening when you participate in that? That even if the other person is technically wrong, possibly your approach on how to deal with them is also wrong. So sometimes you have to use scriptures. I wish I had a dollar for every time someone has ever told me that, well, you sinned when I say something, or who gave you the authority to do so? And every time I look at it, I just say, God did. What do you mean? I said, if you look in scriptures, God has given me the authority. In fact, he has given me the responsibility, as he's given each one of you, is to teach and rebuke and use the word of God to basically help people along. You have a responsibility. Once you join the club, you have a responsibility to make sure the club stays pure and to discipline if you necessarily have to. And ultimately, which people don't ever follow in the churches today, we have the responsibility as a church to do what if someone is unwilling to repent and turn their ways? What's the ultimate sanction? Kick them out. I have been members of churches and I have never seen a church ever kick anyone out. In fact, I have very rarely ever seen them go to the point where in the step before kicking them out is to confront them publicly and they have a chance to repent. You're first to do it in private, but if that resists, then you bring it out in the public. But I've never seen people ever be disciplined by church ever, to be honest with you, in any church, no matter what they've done, minor, major, etc. They may say a word, but they don't actually do anything. There's no consequence. And as I explained to you, and people don't like this and don't agree with me. The only way that human behavior will change is there has to be a negative consequence. A positive consequence will only work if the person who is getting the consequence or the award wants that particular award. If I want a sticker and that's the sticker I want, I will change my behavior. If it's a sticker that I don't like or I don't like stickers, I couldn't care less how many stickers you give me. If it is going to cause pain and agony to me personally, I will change it because nobody wants to suffer. Even a masochist has a degree of suffering they won't go beyond. No one wants to suffer to the point of death. The reason why you have to teach hell before you teach heaven 
People will only be drawn to heaven if they have a rough life going on right now. If everything is satisfactory, heaven has no draw for them. But no one, no matter how bad your life is and how many bad things are going there, if you truly understand the consequence of eternal hell and what goes on there, no one wants that because it's a lot worse no matter how bad it is in this world. <coughs> so we have to do it. People will only change if there is a consequence. If you don't place a consequence consequence on an individual, and people always tell me, and I guess I'm kind of an Old Testament guy, that you're too harsh, you're too legalistic. When you stand before Christ, and it comes to that day where he's going to judge you, it is an absolute standard. Have you lived a perfect life? The answer is going to be no. So you failed, but alternatively, did you put your faith in my son on the cross and did you live faithfully and obediently? If the answer is yes, welcome aboard. If not, off to hell you go. And it's not going to be any arguing. It's not going to be second guess. It is an absolute standard that you have to live by. People who do not like black and white, boy, do you live in the wrong universe and follow the wrong God because there is no gray with God. People do not like that, but that is the way it is. Are there consequences? to sin always you cannot sin and not make a problem for someone or yourself people do not want to address sins of other people because ultimately it's unpleasant for you even though you didn't do it but you still got to deal with it if someone does something in this church and causes discord as a leader I took on the responsibility to deal with that and it's not fun I don't want to confront someone I don't want to make an example of someone, but that's the responsibility I have. It would be better if no one sinned. But boy, do we live in a fallen world and there will always be sin. You cannot sin and not cause hurt and pain to someone, either yourself or some other person. It will always happen there. So what we can do is nip it in the bud so that it doesn't continue. But undealt with sin will always grow. It will always fester. It will always get worse. It will have more consequences. Ignoring or postponing dealing with it does not make things better. It never has. It never will. So we have to understand that. So let's go ahead and get into our first point. Script Scriptures inspired. The scriptures, both the Old and the New Testaments, are verbally inspired of God and are the revelation of God to man, the infallible, authoritative rule of faith and conduct. First scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. If we want to be saved and eternally with our God who created us, how do we do it? He's given us the steps. If you want salvation, it comes through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And where do we get that? By being wise. And how do we become wise? By renewing of our mind. And how do we renew our mind? By hearing the word of God. That is the formula to salvation. Okay? God doesn't pour magic pixie dust on you. It doesn't happen by being a lump in the log, by occasionally coming to church. There is no other way. You do not study God's Word faithfully and daily. You are not going to make it home to salvation. That's the plan. That's the methodology. That's how it works. You can't come to God in your own right. You cannot become wise. God reaches lost people, and people think that it's through our spirit. It is through our spirit. That's how he communicates. But it is through the human mind. It is through our reason. God doesn't do it through emotions. He doesn't do it through feelings. It is through intelligence and through the mind. And yet we downplay that in the church today. In Pentecostalism, it's all about the feeling and the emotion and feeling the Holy Spirit. All of that is true, and there is power in that, but you'll never get to that point unless you open your mind and become receptive and do the Word of God. That is why, and I told you before, I am well aware that if I ever became a pastor, I would be a church of one she would not even come to my church. I understand that and I know that, but I would make it mandatory if I had the ability that no one could belong to this church unless they attend Bible study every single week. Now, I understand there always be an exception and whatever. What magic number is absolute, I don't know, but the intent is there. And the reason is, I know without God's word, you're not going to make it home. I know it. It's just not going to happen, and yet we downplay it so much. That is why there is problems in any church is because of that. In fact, there's two things that always drove me crazy when I deal with pastors. One is I've heard pastors that say, well, you got to be easy on people when dealing with sin because they cannot help but sinning. Hogwash. Hogwash. 
Hogwash. Let me rebuke that there. When you are unsaved, the answer is true. They cannot help themselves. But once you believe and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and the Holy Spirit within you and you have the Word of God and you have the illumination of the Holy Spirit and His teachings and you have all of the attributes and all of the tools that God gives you, hogwash, you have everything you need to stop sinning. You just choose not to do it because sin is a choice. I never have to commit another sin. Now, I can't undo the past, and once a sin has been committed, I can't undo it. Thank God because of God, He's given me an opportunity to cover those sins, but I never have to commit another sin because if I do, I choose to do so. That's why people, when they tell me that what if I commit a sin right before I die, then you have no one to blame but yourself because you chose to rebel against God right before you died and should there not be a consequence to that if you do. And a sin cannot be committed that is accident because it has to be purposeful. You have to choose it. Now, can you violate God's law without purpose? Yes. There may be some temporal consequences in this earth because you do, but there is not a salvation consequence. You have to purpose rebellion against God, and if you do, you cannot claim innocence. You know you did it. So that is hogwash. It drives me crazy that people say that. The other one is that you can't make people attend a Bible study, and I say hogwash. If you know that's the only way they can come to salvation, are you doing them any service by letting them off the hook? The reason why people aren't in Bible study is there's one, no consequence, and second of all, we downplay the importance of it. Anybody argues about what I'm telling you, go to 2 Timothy. He gave you the formula to salvation. That's how you do it. There is no other way. You have to become wise by studying God's Word, by believing it, which leads you to faith in Christ Jesus. You cannot come to Christ without one Him knocking on your heart's door through the Holy Spirit, but second of all, without accepting His truth. People always told me that you cannot tell if someone's been born again. Not true. There's two ways you can do it. Individually, you know whether someone's been born again is how. You know that you have accepted Christ as a Christian. If you truly have believed, you know you have. People who always tell me that, well, I don't know when I became a Christian. Again, hogwash. You cannot change 180 degrees in how you view life and how you experience life and not see a difference in the scenery. If you can't tell any difference between your life before accepting Christ and not, you have never accepted Christ. And I don't care who you are and you can argue with me all you want there. It is impossible to turn your eyes onto heaven as opposed to hell and not know a difference is there. If someone is a addict, and they have a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction, there is a pivot point where they can point directly on that day and know I changed my life and I understand I hit rock bottom and I decided to make a change. In order for you to be a Christian, you have to have the same things, a spiritual change. If you cannot point to when that is, you have never had a counter with God. If you have a film and you have radiation hit it, it will always be there. If Christ has encountered you, if you've had an encounter of Christ, you can never not be different because of that encounter. Otherwise, you have never had an encounter of Christ. It's impossible. How you can also know, and this isn't scriptural, this is a Bowmanism, but I believe it's absolutely true. You know that someone has been born again if they do not question the Word of God. If any Christian reads the Bible and questions any jot or any tittle, they are not born again. Why? When you are born again, what happens? You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The whole ministry of the Holy Spirit is to do what? Bring glory to Jesus Christ. If you doubt any word, which is the inspired word of God, who came through God, it was written by man, but it was through an inspiration. If you doubt any jot or tittle of it, then you doubt Christ, because the Bible is a reflection of whom? In the beginning there was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word is God. To doubt His Word is to doubt God Himself. So therefore, if you doubt God's Word, if you only believe 90% of the Bible and pick and choose like Jefferson, you've never been born again, guys, because it is who He is. Now, I have to temper that a little bit based on what I told you earlier, the fact that some of the doctrine and the translations have been corrupted, and you have to understand that, 
but that still doesn't mean that you don't understand that what I'm telling you is that principle. But that is a test. If you have someone standing in front of you arguing whether this is true in the Bible and I don't believe it, etc., that person's never been born again because he's not indwelt by the Holy Spirit because that is the sole purpose of the Holy Spirit is to bring glory to Jesus Christ. And if he allows you to doubt God's word, then he's allowing you to doubt Christ and that's contrary to what he is, so if you understand that. Well, I've got 10 o'clock, and any questions I can answer for you? Man, I zipped along. I got through one page today, huh? Very good. Well, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to come together today, Lord. Hopefully nothing came out of my mouth which was not a direct revelation from you. Lord, as we leave here today, let's go into the worship center and give you glory let's give you praise understanding that it is about you let's listen to your word let's drop it down to our spirit let's understand that lord we have been put on this earth as a church body for a purpose that when we leave here today if we have the opportunity and the holy spirit prompts us to impact other people's life to teach them about you time is short you're coming back we won't always have this opportunity and Lord, let's never not take advantage of the opportunities that are presented. There are people lost throughout this world, but there are so many people even in Citrus County that we can impact. We can't impact people in Iraq. We can't impact people in Russia, but we can certainly impact people in Beverly Hills in Citrus County. Let's take the opportunity. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. amen.